I'm honey, 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 honey. So honey, I'm honey, honey. Uh, let's talk about the Orpheus dinosaurs. Ceratopsians are pretty hard to mistake for anything that isn't a dinosaur, but most people categorize them into what is Triceratops and whatever isn't Triceratops, which I think is a little unfair. So I want to show you guys how special this group is by taking you through what it takes to be a Ceratopsian as well as their evolutionary story. This group was named and made famous as part of the great dinosaur rush of the 19th century with members being first described by the infamous rivals Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drucker Cope, which, by the way, might as well have gone on the Jerry Springer show. Seriously, it was hilarious, the video's here. But from there, further remains were excavated around the world that showed that this group was a giant bunch of weirdos. These guys varied a lot in size and pedalism, with many smaller members being bipedal, which I'll expand upon in a minute, and were generally relatively bulky with shorter-than-usual tails. This group were also the only dinosaurs that actually adopted the classic posture of not having their tail parallel to the ground. The pelvis was fused in such a way that the sacral vertebrae was angled more towards the floor. So whilst the tail didn't drag along the floor, it did point towards it before swooping up slightly. Now the bodies were recognisable as Ceratopsian without the skull given their robust proportions. But let's face it, we're here for the skulls. Ceratopsian skulls were huge. Now, if you take away all of the nuances that made these skulls stand out, these were actually fairly typical archosaur skulls. Again, just bloody huge. But certain additions made them what they are, which varied depending on what group you're looking at. Ceratopsia is a big group, with more basal members such as Cetacosaurus and the Leptoceratopsians being the smaller, bipedal bunch with an ever so slight frill and beak. Cetacosaurus in particular is an interesting one because along with finding out what colour this dinosaur was, which I talk more about here, we also see that it had a series of bristle-like filaments running along its tail. Since this is a basal member quite close to the origins of Ceratopsians, many have speculated that this was an ancestral feature that could have been seen to some degree on all members. Along with skin impressions from other members hinting that many may have had cone-like scales or short spines across the torso, then we get to the protoceratopsids, which grew to sizes between that of a house cat and a wolf, and were beginning to show more of a frill and a much deeper snout and beak. After that, we get to the main group that people normally think of. Ceratopsids is a family made up of the big boys that we usually associate with this group, ranging from around 4 to 9 metres or 13 to 29 feet in length. Now, they famously had those massive frills and facial horns, with Triceratops being the first to come to mind. But no offence to Triceratops, its ornamentation was pretty boring compared to other members. Ceratopsids are further divided into two subfamilies, the first of which are the Chasmosaurines. This side of the family were the guys like the namesake Chasmosaurus, Triceratops, Utahceratops, Titanoceratops, and Taurosaurus. These were the guys that had longer but plainer frills and very prominent brow horns. They were also slightly larger as a general rule of thumb, but this wasn't the case across the board. Triceratops is thought to have been the biggest overall, but depending on whether it is simply the same species, Taurosaurus just about beats it, but the largest skull of any terrestrial animal in Earth's history goes to Pentaceratops, with a skull height measuring in at 10 foot 6 inches. And if you're confused about whether it's the same species, I do talk about that here. Then we have the Centrosaurines. These guys weren't really much different to the Chasmosaurines in their bodies, except for the fact that they had little to no brow horns, but much more prominent structures on their nasal bones, whether that be a sharp horn or a thick bony mass. They also had smaller frills relative to their skulls, but ones that were highly decorated with a variety of spikes and structures in all sorts of weird directions. This group includes Centrosaurus, Albertoceratops, Pachyrhinosaurus, Xenoceratops, Diabloceratops, Medusaceratops, and my personal favourite Ceratopsian, Styracosaurus. As to why these guys had the weird frills and horns, we will get into that in just a sec, because it's not as obvious as you might think. First, we need to look into how they got to this point. Ceratopsians appear to have gotten their start somewhere in Asia. The earliest members we have that are ancestral to this group, such as animals like Tetacosaurus, can be found all over this continent. 
before the more derived forms that we see crop up in the middle of the Cretaceous spread out via the land bridge that existed at the time. From here they grew in size and got a lot more spiky. Their horny faces and size not only likely evolved to help them defend against predators, which were mainly Tyrannosaurids, but also likely evolved as a result of intraspecific competition, with the eyes being placed in such a way that they could avoid being pronged by opposing horns. Ontogenetic stages, which are the stages that an animal goes through as it ages, show that most Ceratopsians didn't actually develop their ornamental structures and horns until they got to sexual maturity, meaning it could have been a tool of Mr. Still Your Girl. But there are issues with both the defensive and display theories. Firstly, many of these frills were actually excessively thin and often just, well, non-existent in places given the giant holes. Considering that it wouldn't have protected much other than just the neck, most of them wouldn't have even done a very good job at that. Despite how spiky many of them looked as well, those spikes weren't often shaped in a way that made much sense for defence, bending in some weird directions. Furthermore, we see a lot of vascularization in many of these frills, especially on the surface, and you really don't want a huge amount of blood supply to something that is supposed to be attacked. This vascularization on the surface of the bone often means that something else is covering it though, so it's thought that Ceratopsians didn't just have keratin horns, they may have had a whole keratin helmet, so maybe it was more protective than it looks. On the other hand, the main argument against them being a mating display is the fact that we are yet to see any sort of sexual dimorphism on any Ceratopsian. If these frills and horns were purely for mating display and competition, surely one of the sexes would have lacked them as adults. We've found many specimens of many of these species. The odds are pretty low on them having all been male or female so far. But to be fair, we don't actually know what kind of patterns or colours set the sexes apart. But that still means that these structures had other functions. With all those blood vessels, those frills could flush with colour and act as excellent thermoregulation tools. Shedding heat, being carried to the frill and collecting it to take around the rest of the body. So if there's conflicting information, what were they actually used for? Well, to be fair, just because something hasn't evolved perfectly for just one function doesn't mean that it couldn't do multiple functions just about good enough. Sort of a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none situation. Maybe they did use their tools for self-defense against predators and in ritualistic combat, or using flushing colors to catch someone's eye in their thermoregulation tools. It's also been noted that Ceratopsians have some of the most efficient teeth in the animal kingdom, seconded only by hadrosaurs. These guys had a battery of teeth either side of the mouth behind that beak, which would continuously replace themselves, usually before the previous tooth had even fallen out. This, along with the clipping beak and immense jaw strength, meant that Ceratopsians could handle even the toughest of plant matter, which grew in abundance due to the fact that nothing else could eat them. Whatever it is they were doing, they were doing it right, because their diversification happened astoundingly quickly. To the point that by the time that we see ceratopsids, they would often make up around a third of the dinosaur population of a given area. In terms of sheer biomass, these guys were the bison of the Cretaceous. Meaning that if you went for a walk through Hell Creek, the likeliest dinosaur you would see the most of would be Triceratops. Now we see these species transition into each other right up until the group's extinction thanks to the KPG mass extinction event that wiped out all non-avian dinosaurs. Which takes us very smoothly into today's Q&A, which comes from... Dread Ender? But it's a DR34DEND3R. You guys are really, really testing me with these names. Anyway, they have asked... I always see people refer to size in paleontology as directly linked to mass. But this doesn't really make sense to me. What about surface area or volume? I talk to all my chemistry, physics, and biology professors, and in chemistry and biology, size isn't a term that we really ever use. It's either amount, surface area, or volume. And for physics, it's just volume. This is also stated in various papers I've read, and I'm wondering if paleontology is an exception, or if the whole mass equals size thing is just a misconception. Yes, I'm very glad you asked this because it can end up being a massive grey area that leads to a lot of misconceptions. Because let's face it, size is actually a really vague term. Now this isn't often a big deal because surface area and mass are often correlated and kind of go up and down with each other. But this isn't always the case. 
Now try to be careful when I say the word size or biggest because there are animals that are taller or longer than other animals that are actually heavier so the surface area can be misleading. But in most sciences, unless stated otherwise, when we're talking about what is the biggest or the smallest of something, we are actually referring to its mass or how heavy it was. Again, 99% of the time this distinction isn't really noticed because how visually big an animal is directly related to its weight. But on the odd occasion, like when comparing the biggest theropods, a T-Rex is technically larger than Spinosaurus despite the fact that Spinosaurus was longer and depending on how it stood, possibly taller, but T-Rex was heavier. Anyway, I hope that helped and I hope you've enjoyed this video enough to consider leaving a like and subscribe if you haven't already and I will catch you guys next time.